want to say I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm thankful for what I've already felt here tonight, just Amen. for the presence of the Lord. Uh, I desire your prayers tonight. I don't really know how we're going to go. The Lord's laid something on my heart. He's had it on there for probably two or three weeks, if not longer. Yeah. I ain't been able to preach it yet, but he's kind of—I think he's going to let me go there tonight. So I don't know what we're going, how we're going to go about it, or what we're going to do. But you just be much in prayer for us here tonight. Uh, we'll be in chapter four of the book of Acts, and we'll start reading in verse one. It said, "And as they spake, the people and the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they had taught the people and preached through Jesus the res- resurrection for the de- from the dead." And they laid hands on them and put them in hold, and the next and put them in hold. And the next day, for it was now even tide, howbeit many of them were heard of the word believed, and the number of the men that were about, were about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and the elders and the scribes and Ananias and the high priests and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many were of the kindred of the high priests were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the middle, they asked by them, What power or why by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if it we this day be examined of the good deed we have done, impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto all you and all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God, God raised from the dead, even by him do this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught, and you the builders which become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other form or any other, from there is none other name under heaven given among where men must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, and they, that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do? To these men, for indeed the notable miracle had been done by them that is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that spread it no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak the henceforth to no man, henceforth to no man in this name. You all can be seated. And the Lord kind of showed me this. And it's just kind of funny the way that He kind of showed me all this. You know, we're looking at a at a community, at a country nowadays that don't that you can you can talk about God, you can talk about church. But you get to mentioning Jesus, and you get to talking about in the power and in the blood and in the name of Jesus Christ. People get a little up, get a little uptight. They get a little shaky. So these men here seen that. These men seen that the miracles that you can go back in chapter two and look at the things that was done. You can go back in chapter three and see the things that had already been done. You where the lame man was healed that they spoke about here. The lame man was healed, and they seen those things that was already done. So they knew that there was something going on with these men. They knew that these men had come and they were speaking in Jesus' name, and they didn't like that. And just like the world is today, they don't like that. They don't like when something gets out of sorts a little bit. They don't like when they can't explain what's going on. They don't like when there's men or women stand up before Jesus and say, hey, there's something different about this situation. They don't like when we do those things. So that's the way that the world, they have no problem with church. The world has no problem with church, have no problem with religion, but you get in the mention in Jesus. You get in to throw Jesus' name out there and tell them that you must be born again. There in verse 12 it says, Neither is there any salvation, and therefore there is no other name but under heaven by which man must be saved. You know, you can look at the world that we live in and they tell you that there's multiple ways to get to heaven. There's multiple things that you have to do. You can sign cards. You can get gifts off there. They tell you that there's everything that you can do. The Bible right there plainly tells me that there's no other way. There's just one way that they may be able to get to heaven. But these men, and I want to look at these men here tonight, as they got, they were bold in what they were doing. They knew yeah. Jesus called them out from a, from a crowd. He called them out to be different. Yeah. He called them out that they could be ministers unto these people. And I got to looking and thinking about what a minister actually is, you know, and, and and a lot of us, we look at those things and we always associate it with the man of God standing behind the pulpit. We always associate a minister with somebody who preaches the Word of God. Well, then I got to looking at a, a, the, one of the definitions that I could find of a minister was that it attends to the needs of someone. Yeah. That's all that it needs. That's all that we have to do to be ministered to someone is that we can attend to the needs of someone else. And then uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, uh, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and 4 says, But all things approve ourselves as ministers of God yeah. in much patience, in affections, in necessities, and in difficulties, or in distresses. 
So we're all ministers to under God. It ain't just not just the man of God that's standing up here behind the pulpit. Not just the deacons. Not just the song leaders. We are all ministers under God. So we all have a responsibility to do these things that these men were doing. Unscared of what was going on. Unscared that, that hey, you can look and, and you can read here that they were threatened and threw in jail. There are multiple times through this chapter, through this book of Acts, they were threw in jail multiple times. Chapter 5, they were in prison again and it said, the angel come to him and said, hey, I'm going to loose you, but when I loose you, I expect you to go to the temple and you speak boldly on these things that I'm telling you to do. That's what God wants us to do. He wants to loose us here tonight and we can go out to the, into the temple, out to the community and speak boldly on these things of what Jesus has done for us. Not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything good that we are, but so people may see that. So those lost loved ones that we have in our life, those lost family members, they can see something different in our life. Like I said a minute ago, I was that one. I was that one that sat back and knew people was praying for me. I was that one that sat back and didn't want those changes in my life. I didn't want nobody to, to pray for me. I didn't want salvation because I was having fun out in the world. I was having fun doing all the things that I thought that the world had in store for me. But I couldn't get over those prayers. Those prayers were, were too powerful for me. Those prayers were too too important in my life that, 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 that those people kept praying and kept praying and kept pushing everything that they had praying for me. And that's what we must do is we must be able to, to, to be where these men are. They're no different than what we are today. There's different. There may be some different circumstances out there. There may be some different demons that we face, different obstacles that we face. But these men face the same things. We can look, we can say, and well, hey, they were through in jail. How many of us really tonight are, are, would, would stand here and say, hey, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing for you to throw me in jail that I can tell somebody about Jesus Christ. We've seen that, what it happened. We've seen what happened firsthand, what has happened through that. But we sit back and we start thinking about those things. Oh, well, I'll just keep my mouth shut. I ain't going to worry about that. I'm not going to press the issue because somebody's going to get upset at me. Somebody's going to get mad at me. Somebody's going to tell me that I'm wrong. Yeah. So what do we do? We back off. We back off when we shouldn't back off. The Bible tells me to speak boldly on these things. It tells me to stand for what I believe in, for what Jesus has done for me. He tells me that it's okay to, to profess Him. It's okay to tell the world that they're lost if He's in it. Now, if I get out here and start doing all these things in myself and start saying all these things about myself and lift, uplifting myself and saying, hey, I draw this person to Jesus. I did this work. I did that work. See, we've done missed the mark right there. It ain't nothing about it. It shouldn't be about any of us in here tonight. It shouldn't be about the man that's standing behind the pulpit or playing the piano or singing the songs or leading the church. It shouldn't be about any of those things. What we need to be focused on is the world out there. It's the world that we can show them who Jesus Christ is and boldly show them. Amen. Not sugarcoat it like the world wants us to do. Hey, it, hey, it's easy to go to church. It's easy. I mean, you, you look at the, at the world that we live in today. I would be, and I don't know this for a fact, but I say that there's more people going to church today than there has been in the history of the world. I say that there's more people going, especially on Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings they're going to these big fancy churches and big things where big light shows, and they're going to all these places. There's more people in the, in churches than there ever has been. But what those places are making, missing is the Word of God being preached. Because we know that if the Word of God's preached, that He'll draw all men to Him. And see, we can't go out there and live the same, un, the same ungodly way that we was when we went in there. Yeah. If God changes us, He truly changes us. Right. Hey, I know that from experience. I can, say, I can stand right here firsthand and tell you who exactly that I used to be. That man is dead. That man is no longer around anymore. That man that has no reign in my life. Now don't get me wrong, that man tries to flare his head up sometimes. That man tries to say, hey, you remember what you used to do? You remember who you used to be? He tries to show himself a little bit every now and then. But then God speaks, or Jesus speaks, and says, hey, you remember what I did for you? You remember where I brought you from? And that old man will go to hiding. That old man will go back to where he needs to go to. See, and it, but we can look at all these things at all these different times where they were in prison and all these different things that they've done. Hey, and don't, don't take me wrong here when I say this because like I said it's not about us. It's not about what we can do. But it's about what God can do through us. If God can do those things through these men, the Bible tells me that He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So why can't we stand just as boldly as this man stood? Why can't we stand and say, hey, 
and preach the gospel. Why can't we stand and say, hey, these things are wrong. We must live this way in order to get to heaven. We must do these things. Because we let Satan infiltrate our minds. We let Satan infiltrate what we think we can do and what we think we can't do. Yeah. Because he don't want us standing boldly. Yeah. When we go to stand boldly, he gets uncomfortable. Because he knows that at the, at the mighty name of Jesus, he has to flee. So, And it may be hard. There may be some instances in our life where, and I'm sure that if you look through these men of God, you look at the, some of the things that they were faced with. You know, They were told multiple times, hey, you can go out and you can do whatever you want to. You can be religious. You can tell everybody about what you've done and all that, but don't mention that name. Don't mention that name because you get people in an uproar. You get people worried. You get people concerned about their flesh, about their soul. If you start mentioning the name of Jesus, people start getting concerned. Hey, that's a good thing for us Christian people to do is, hey, you mention Jesus to that lost one you work with. You mention Jesus to that, even if it's just a, something as simple as, or they throw a cuss word, simple, something as simple as say, hey, you know Jesus loves you. And watch them. They'll get uncomfortable. Yeah. Because they know that there's power in that. See, Satan's done got them. He knows. But, that, but they know that there's power in that name. So if he can bound us down and keep that name out of our mouth and keep that name put in and not let us speak that name, he's done his job. But if I'll boldly stand and preach the name of Jesus, whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching, whether it's singing, or whatever we need to do, if we will boldly do it for Jesus Christ, we can see the effects of these men right here. And I'm not saying that it may be something that we never see here physically as a church. It may be something that goes out through the, the YouTube messages. It may be something that somebody by word of mouth tells somebody about. We don't know the true effects of what happened here. You know, they give us numbers here in the Bible of, of 3,000 and 5,000 people that were saved. But can you imagine how many of those 3,000 and 5,000 people that were saved? So you've got 8,000 people went and told somebody about what happened to them? Yeah. If those 8,000 people went and said, hey... Come and see a man that told me everything that I'd ever done. Come and see a man that knew, that, that, that forgave me from everything that i ever done, that washed me clean, give me a new wife, give me a new, a new purpose. Come see this man. It's hard telling to see how far that it actually trickled down. How far that those 8,000 people really truly had reached. You can read on through here. There's different, many, many different yeah. examples yeah. of God's people being persecuted. So to me, that tells me that, hey, I probably ain't doing enough right now. Yeah, amen. You say, well, yeah. what, what do you mean there? Yeah. Why? Well, you want to be persecuted? No. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be. I don't, none of us want to be made fun of or mocked or put down. Yeah. But these men didn't care. So that tells me that I probably care a little bit about what the world tells me. Because I've got a lot of people that, that I work with. A lot of people that I come in contact with every day that they'll talk to me. They're fine with me as long as I don't go getting Jesus on them. As long as I don't want to start mentioning that. If I start mentioning those things, they turn their back real quick. They're ready to walk away. And what do I do? A lot of times I'm guilty in saying that. What do I do? I'll just shut my mouth. And go back to work. Yeah. I'm guilty in that. I'll be the first one to admit to you. I'm guilty in that. Mm -hmm. But I can read these stories right here and I know what I ought to do. I know how I ought to stand. I know what I ought to say. And again, I'm not telling you to go out to the world to, to your workplaces and tell everybody that you work with that they're lost, dying, and headed for hell. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you listen to God. You listen to tell Him what He tells you to tell Him. He'll open a door. If He's got somebody in your path, somebody that you've been praying for, somebody that's on your mind about something, He'll direct you in that. Yeah. You know, I found Him faithful in all those things. Almost every time I ask Him, Lord, put somebody in my path today. He will. But I had to be willing to do my part to do that. And I've been in this, the opposite side of that. I've asked for us, Lord, put me somebody in my path. And they walk and then I, here it'll go. And then here I'm uh, backing up. Backing up on what I just asked God to do for me. Yeah. Shame on me. Shame on me for the things for not standing bold. Shame on me for being concerned about what the world thinks about me. Shame on me for letting my thoughts and my opinions and others' thoughts and others' opinions control what Jesus would have me to do. You can look on, on over here. You can keep reading. 
through all these things. Let me, I want to read you one more story if I can find it here. And it's again, it's very familiar scripture. It's chapter 20, or chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Verse 25, and it said, At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. See, they had done again been through in jail for what they were doing. They had done been told, hey, stop this. Stop this. And that's all that they had had to do. All they had had done was just stop. Yep. And that left them alone. They wouldn't have cared what they were doing if they had stopped preaching Jesus Christ. They would have just left them alone and let them go about their business. But they didn't. They didn't care what the world said. They didn't care what the world threw at them. They didn't care. You can even go back before. You can even go back and look at another man called Stephen. What did he tell them? He got right down in their business. He told them exactly where they were living, exactly who they were, exactly what sinners they were. And what they do to him, he cut them so bad with the word of God that they stoned him to death. They didn't like it. They stoned him to death and laid, their clo laid his clothes at a man named Saul's feet that thought he was a religious man. He thought he knew the law. He thought that he knew what he was doing was okay. Wasn't he in for a surprise? Yeah. Then we go and we read this here. It says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. See, they, they, were, they were happy in the state that they were in. They were happy sitting in that cell. They were happy being persecuted by, for Jesus Christ. Are we? Am I? No, a lot of times I'm not. A lot of times I'm not happy when people start persecuting me. I'm not happy when people start talking about me. I'm not happy when people say, hey, would you look at this guy? He's all the time reading his Bible. He's all the time telling me about Jesus. Sometimes we get concerned about those things. So then in turn, we'll, that will shut our mouth. And we won't say nothing else because we're concerned about what's going on in the world. We're not content to be in persecution. Jesus told me in the Bible that, hey, they hated me first. They're going to hate you just as well. And again, I, I, that's not. What, don't take me wrong here tonight. I'm not telling you to go out and make everybody hate you. That's not what. That's not what I'm trying to get across here tonight. But what I'm trying to get across here is: is are we doing enough? Are we doing enough that the world can see who Jesus is through us? Again, and I, and I can't look at nobody else but myself. Because I see the persecution that I face and it ain't very much. It ain't very hard for me to go to work on, on, the, ne on the next day. It ain't very hard for me to come home. It ain't very hard for me to go to the grocery store. It ain't very hard for me to do those things. Yeah. Again, you're saying, well, preacher, you, you want me to just be absolutely uncomfortable? That's not necessarily what I'm saying, but yes, in a roundabout way. If you're working for God and He's telling you to do things, there's been many times in my life that I've been uncomfortable. Yeah. I've had to get uncomfortable to let Him use me, to let Him move into my, into my life. I've had to get uncomfortable sometimes. I had to get uncomfortable tonight yeah. to stand up here in front of you. This is not something that, that I would have, you would have never told me in a million years that you'd have me in front of a pulpit preaching to a church on Wednesday night. I'd have laughed at you and told you you were crazy. But God knows what He's doing. He knows the persecution is going to come. But in all of that, we need to find joy. We need to find peace in those troubles and those tribulations. Because if we're lifting Him up, we're out, you know, and I believe that with all of my heart, that the only reason that I'm left here is to help draw somebody to God. Amen. And then you can't convince me otherwise. Because if He had saved me for nothing else, the day that he saved me, he'd have called me out. Amen. He'd have, I'd have fell over on the altar. I'd have never made it up off the altar. But he didn't do that. Yeah. Because he told me to go out to the highways and the hedges and compel those that are lost. Tell them to come in. Tell them about Jesus. Get uncomfortable for me. If we'll get uncomfortable for him, hey, he's going to be there in the struggles. He's going to be there in the trials. And I, I, We're going to read this here in just a second. But through all those things that they went through, you never heard them murmur. You never heard them complain. You never heard them say, God, why'd you throw me in the jail? Why did you let Stephen die? Stephen, the moment that they were stoning him, he was looking up and saying, forgive them. Think of that. I seen this thing one time that said, the very person, the last person that probably saw Stephen was Paul. Being Paul, or Saul, we'll say Saul, in the state that he was in, was probably one of the last people that saw Stephen before he left here. 
And I believe that when when Saul passed on, went to heaven, I believe Stephen was one of the first ones there to greet him. Say so why? Because he preached to him. He told him about Jesus. He got him uncomfortable in his sins. He got him uncomfortable in the things. Because if he wasn't uncomfortable, they wouldn't have killed him. Yeah. He wouldn't have had those marching orders to say, hey, you take these Christian people that are standing up and you kill them, you put them in jail, you do whatever you need to do to them to shut them up. See, so he was already uncomfortable in those things. It said in verse 26, and it said, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. See that? But here, they didn't just run out. The doors were, were open. They sat there. They sat there a minute. You know, and I, there may have been some that just flee and say, Hey, these doors are open. I'm out of here. See, but Paul and Silas knew that they were there for a mission. They were there for a reason. They were there to, to help somebody to get to know Jesus. And said, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing that the prison doors were open, he drew out his own, forward and would have, own sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. See, he knew what was about to happen to him. He knew, hey, I done let these men go that have been causing trouble all throughout the region. They've been preaching Jesus. They've been causing all kinds of trouble, and they're gone. I was in charge of keeping them there and they're gone. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Yeah. See, I believe that jailer started thinking right there. So, well, man, these doors are all open. Why are you still here? You had free reign to leave. You had free reign to get out of here. And nobody would have known it. Nobody would have knew that you was gone till I woke up. He said, Then he called for a light and sprang, into the, sprang in and came into them. And fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, so there was something happening in this process. There was something happening with Paul and Silas being through in jail that this jailer might be saved. There may be something happening in our situation that we face every day that we have to go through. Hey, maybe I had to face a little persecution. Maybe I had to face a little jail time. Maybe I had to face some of these things. But I need to be content in those things. Whatever state that I'm in, let me be content in it, Lord. Whether it's hard, whether it's a battle, whether it's a, a, I'm up in the valley or whether I'm down in the valley or up on the mountaintop, let me be content in those things. That way people can see who God is in my life. Help me to get uncomfortable. Now, people don't like that, and I know that. I don't like that. I don't like being uncomfortable. It's an awkward feeling. But there's reasoning in all those things. There's reasoning in, a, in the uncomfort. There's reasoning in doing the work for God. Hey, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Everybody would be on board. If Christianity was, and don't get me wrong, it's the greatest thing that I have ever received. The greatest gift that God has ever given to me is my Christianity. The day that He saved me, there is nothing better than that. But I'd be lying to you if I stood here tonight and told you that there's not been times in my life where it's been really hard. There's, I'd be standing here lying if I told you within the past week, I told my wife, or I told him last Sunday at church, Sunday morning, I said, hey, I was in a spot last Wednesday that I didn't know what in the world I was going to do. I was in a battle that I had never been in before. I'd been in some battles, but nothing like this one. And I had to get uncomfortable in that situation. To let God help me. And again, I'm not telling you this to uplift myself. I'm not telling you that in any way or any shape or form. It was last Wednesday. I was sitting at work and there was just things going wrong, left and right. People called in. People wasn't doing their job. They wasn't doing what they were asked to do. Mm -hmm. Stuff was coming back and that we were having to fix everything. We were just behind. And the Satan took that and he ran with it. Mm -hmm. And I let him run for a probably about four or five hours. I let him run all day long with it. Finally, the Lord spoke to me and said, hey, why don't you just pray about it? I said, okay, Lord, yeah, I can do that. So I stand at my table and I'm, I keep working. I don't stop what I'm doing. I just keep working and praying to myself there, thinking that that's good enough. You know, that's exactly what I need to do. That's exactly how I'm going to overcome this is I was just going to stand here and I'm going to pray to myself and nobody hear me. Didn't work. Didn't work. He said, I said pray. 
So I had to bow myself right there at my table at work in front of everybody. Let everybody look at me and see. Again, not for myself, not for my glorification, but they had to see that, hey, I needed some help. And they knew that I was frustrated. They knew that things were going on. They knew that I was aggravated. And I don't know if any of them seen me or not. But I got down and I prayed. I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me here. You're going to have to take this from me. And almost immediately after I got up, the thought came to my mind is, I'm not taking it from you, but I'll be in a battle with you. And it gave me peace in that. Give me peace knowing that he's right there to fight that battle with me. And I'll tell you, that day didn't get no easier from a from a physical standpoint. It just was just as hard. There was as many things went wrong the rest of the day as it did before then. But you know what? I had peace about it. Because I got uncomfortable and let God move in my life. Whether, again, whether anybody's seen that or not. And if they did, I'm not telling you for that reason, but I'm telling you that we must sometimes get uncomfortable and let God work. See, somebody may have seen that. Somebody may have even been from afar off say, hey, it's 10.30 in the morning. What's he doing? Kneel down at his table. People get to wondering those things. People get to seeing those things. And please, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to to make myself look good because, hey, it took me a battle for four hours to even get to that part. It took me saying, God, I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way and just stand here and keep my mouth shut and just keep working. For him to say, hey, that ain't good enough. That ain't good enough. I need you to do it this way. Just like... The way sometimes just some of the messages that we had to preach. Sometimes some of the things we have to tell our family, tell our brothers, our sisters, our kids, even our spouses sometimes. Sometimes those things ain't comfortable, but God says, hey, it has to be this way. So we have to do them that way or it ain't going to work. I believe with all my heart that if I hadn't nailed down that day and asked God for some help, I honestly don't know what would have happened. I, I was on the verge of walking out and quitting my job and getting in the car and just going home. Now, if I'd have done that, what consequences would that have, have, have caused? I don't know. I don't really know what would happen there. But I'm thankful that God's big enough in our life that He can show us the way out, that He can show us how we must come through these things. And when you, we go to reading about this man, this, this, this jailer man, hey, and it wasn't just him that ended up getting saved. His whole household. Because of the persecution that Paul and Silas faced, that whole household was saved. So what is it to us? Is persecution or is a soul more important to us? I have to ask myself that sometimes. Is it more important for me to be comfortable in the state that I'm living in? Is it more important for me to be comfortable at my workplace? Or do I need to be more concerned about the lost? I know the answer there. Do I always do the best of that? No. No, I'll tell you honestly, I don't. But God will take care of those things. God will put us in a place to where He'd have us to be. God will make, make a way out of these troubles, out of these trials for us. He'll help us in all those times and all those situations that we face. When we get uncomfortable, He'll help us in those things. What more could I ask for than a comforter that He is to me?